All right, all right. Let's see, where is it? Do you guys wanna watch slash talk about Summoning Salt's Mario 3? Yep, seen that trick before. Summoning Salt presents. Super Mario Bros. 3 speedruns are some of the most competitive out there. So there's already something that I wanna mention to a lot of people who don't understand Mario 3 at all. Boom, this level right here, okay? You guys can see my mouse cursor. Getting P speed in this level is something you guys see speedrunners do all the time. But little known fact, I mean, we try and say it as much as we possibly can. The getting P speed at the start of this level is strictly based on RNG with how you run up these two hills. If you have a bad sub pixel, you will not build your extra meters that you need on the P meter. You will not get the P speed build here and it will not extend until the rest of the level. Do you see the last arrow right here? This last arrow has to flash when you run off of this pipe. That lets you know that you did everything earlier correctly. So let me go back one more time. You watch that last arrow, right? Watch the arrow. Super Mario Bros. 3. Boom, right there. You see how it flashed white? That this lets you know. are some of the most competitive Boom, you're gonna get there. it. It has a degree of randomness not found in most platformers. So much out of your control needs to line up. But it also requires relentlessly precise platforming through the entire game. We've already been over warpless world records in this game, but there's another even tougher category. 100%. And over the past 10 plus years... Right here, this is the hardest P-Speed strategy in the game. The P-Meter manipulating is insane. Okay, we're gonna watch it in slow-mo so you guys can kind of get a good idea. Like, it is crazy. Just watch the P-Meter. And over the past 10 plus years... It's become one of the most- Insane, dude! The P-Speed strategy is insane. Yo, drunk summoning salt? 100%. With help from Mitch Flower Power, who's that? So, what is a 100% speedrun? Well, for a normal warpless speedrun of Mario 3, the only requirement is that you can't use any of the game's warp whistles to jump to a later world. However, that category still lets you skip over certain levels. But for 100%, you've got to complete every stage and every map enemy through the entire game. All the numbered levels, forts, airships, and hand stages, as well as enemies like Hammer Brothers and Piranha Plants. It's a brutal. Yep. The origin of this category comes from a speedrun from December 2005, performed by David Gibbons. He held world records in Mario 64, GoldenEye, Castlevania 64, Donkey Kong Country 3, the list just goes on and on. Yeah, dude, he was Our crazy. Christmas. When I entered speedrunning, because he was 2005, he was already so old in the speedrunning scene, is is crazy. At least when I entered Mario 3, that was. Because I, I would follow his run. I actually did a video hyper-analyzing his actual speedrun on my YouTube channel. So anyone watching this on YouTube right now, pause it and go like bookmark it if you want to watch it later. I really break down everything that Gibbons does in his run versus like what we do today. A 100% run clocking in at 1 hour, 24 minutes, and 10 seconds. Gibbons played on the Super Mario All-Stars version of the game. It's crazy that he did that. Gibbons' first goal was to build up the P-meter as often as he could. The P-meter checks route? in World 1, he was able to build it on several occasions, but usually slowed down and lost it slightly after. And all the while, he was collecting items, which the game automatically gives you after completing worlds and fighting Hammer Brothers. He saved most of these until World 7, which features many of the game's longest stages. So oh, in just 7 take damage. Six for like, it's so, so crazy, seven... it's so crazy to think about back in the day with like speedrunning, how the logic of speedrunning affects your common sense. A great example is like this level right here. You have to fly up to the top of the level. In order to do that, it's like nine flutters to get up on the ceiling. However, if you start at the very beginning of the level and you jump right away as soon as the level starts, it starts flying, then you couldn't possibly be any slower than that. But for some reason, David Gibbons runs here. 7-6, for instance. Right? So he ran on the ground. He, all, everything he did at the start of this level, it was just a big waste of time. It just goes to show how, like, premature the mindset was in terms of speedrunning and speed. Because this is just, like, a no-brainer thing. The, the, you don't need previous experience. You don't need, like, knowledge about speedrunning. But it just goes to show, like, the earlier stages of speedrunning and how the average gamer's mind worked when it came to speedrunning. It was often not how optimized you can make every little thing. It was just, like, just get
get through and don't die. It's crazy. So he lost a couple seconds in this level just from what he did. All in all, this was a pretty impressive speedrun for its time. For the next six years, David Gibbon's run remained as the fastest recorded 100% time. That's so crazy with a game as popular as Mario 3. Nobody had a desire to just dominate the game. Nobody had a, like a want or a need. It was insane. When I mean, we're talking 2005, this is how many years after the game came out? For Awesome Games Done Quick 2012, a runner named TJP7154 submitted Mario 3 100%. But his run not was cool. TJP had to practice. And in November 2011, TJP beat the record by over two minutes. A 121.56. Yeah, he used Game Genie. And he was far better at preserving P speed. For instance, in 2-2, he turned back at the start of the stage to build P speed then precisely jumped to maintain. So that strategy right there is another great example of, I would say resources for speedrunners. Like TJP had live split. He had a timer there. He could have individually timed that level, but how was he to individually time it? He obviously didn't play on emulator, so he couldn't create random save states and save them. So how was TJP able to practice individual levels in this game? And that would have to be get to world two, enter the level, try the P-Speed strategy and time it once. Because once you beat the level, you can't go back back into it so had he just simply timed it like once or twice he would know that it's slower oh yeah it's way slower but we wouldn't know Four that because three. rta timing was very hard despite some impressive time saves over david gibbons tjp also died i can't believe tjp went for that a small mario that station. still blows my mind that he went for that it made for an entertaining run despite some obvious places to improve dude that's the end but of an the auto biggest stroller. addition this is stage six dash nine Normally, you enter the pipe and play through the level, but instead, TJP did this. It's called a wall jump, an incredibly difficult glitch in Mario 3. First off, you need to jump into the top 6 pixels of a block, mm -hmm. and then jump again the frame you hit the block. That means you have 6 pixels of wiggle room, and then must time a jump down to the 60th of a second. That's not easy. Depending on how you're lined up, the wall jump can be impossible. Impossible. For instance, the math works out so that you only have a 60% chance to get the wall jump, even if you do everything right. Your subpixel value and distance from the wall must line up properly. Must line up properly. You listen to Summoning Salt, and you listen to it right now, mister. 100%. Another trick that requires both a precise jump and subpixel luck is clipping. If you jump right into the corner of a block as Big Mario, the game thinks his head is stuck inside, and its solution is to zip you out to the right. So essentially, Summoning Salt didn't really mention any more on top of the whole zipping process, and this is something I always like to refresh. The reason Mario zips is it was Nintendo's idea of making sure that you didn't get stuck in walls. Nintendo obviously didn't have any intention for you to do this in walls or anything like that, but it was their way of making sure you didn't soft block and you didn't have to restart the game because Mario 3 didn't have any saves, right? So they had to really do a lot of testing to make sure people weren't forced to reset. But there are some some cases where you can soft block and Nintendo did update some of those things in Mario All-Stars. 3-9 is changed at the end by the pipe so that you can't actually soft block anymore. Even if you get a frame perfect jump every time, Mario only zips less than half the time in practice. As difficult and random as these tricks are, TJP was committed to going for them. He went for the wall jump in 6-9 and got it 7th try. He went for the clip in 7-1 and got it 17th try. He went for a clip in 7-5 and failed 9 times before giving up. Finally, in 7-6, he hit a clip first try. Was this all actually worth it? Despite a lead of over three minutes, TJP couldn't help himself from going all out in the last stage of the game. Damn he started you, TJP. by going in and failing a clip 31 consecutive times. He then returned to the start of the level and attempted a different clip four times before giving up and taking the elevator. He then successfully hit a clip at the top of the level but it actually lost him time because of how slowly you move through the wall. He may have lost over a minute and a half in one stage, but his run looked cool. 
His run looked cool. No. Sag, Sag for TJP. I mean, if TJP was just like, you know what? Whatever, let's get through this world. He could have had like a like a 117 or something, which would have been crazy. TJP's run stood as the official record for about eight months. It was beaten in August 2012. And the runner to do it is pretty well known today. Who? Mitch Flower Power. Oh, come on. I, Mitch had already been a top Mario 3 runner for years. He got the Warpless record in 2010. 2010, guys. Likely had a 100% run faster than TJP's runs back in 2011. So it's interesting that Summoning Saw says that. I did actually have a faster time than TJP. I don't know if TJP ever had a faster time and 100% over me. I was such a broke ass bitch that like, I couldn't afford to like record any of my speed runs or anything. So like the only things that I ever were able to do was just like turn on a timer and do like a run and then just have my own personal like yay i got this time right i couldn't i couldn't go to the forums and really talk about it because it just seems like i'm just some shady ass dude throwing these random times with no video i actually talked with summoning salt about that part historically speaking i did have better times than tjp but i kind of was like you really shouldn't elaborate too much on that in the the video because i have no video proof or anything so i just like ignore that little section of my mario 3 life sources for this claim right i have no clue he was able to do this to the world record. <laughs> Just fucking annihilated it. Oh! 100% <laughs> had just been taken to another level. That was like five and minutes. And the way Mitch did it, P-Speed, P-Speed, P-Speed. Look at those individual levels, 2011. Let's pick a random individual level and see how it compares to how you guys see the level today. What level should we do? 4-3. Uh, 2011. game for so long okay think about it what is this 2011 literally like what 10 years 12 years later like i'm still doing this level that's crazy right seven one this is seven one individual level i fucking stop thank you It wasn't exactly 4K quality. Well, you guys don't like my 4K quality? You guys have a problem with this? I told you guys I was broke. So when people ask me like, how are you so good or how do you get so consistent? Just remember this fortress, this level. This is an incredibly tough stage. I've been doing it for 12 years. So when I mess it up, now you know why I get frustrated. It's like, fuck. You guys like my light as well? It was far from a perfect run, but Mitch's 114 was the new gold standard for 100% runs. Mitch was way ahead of the pack in 100%, but he had one active competitor for warpless runs, a speedrunner known as Karua. Karua. Mitch knew Karua would be an incredible 100% runner if he ever gave it a try, and he encouraged him to start running it. So, later that year, Karua did. And in December, he beat Mitch's world record. Karu is crazy because Karu started watching my speedruns and it got him into speedrunning Mario 3, which is very cool. He definitely liked 100% way more than I did. For me, 100% was when I'm comfortable with Warpless, then I messed around with 100%. It was always like that. And still to this day, it's still pretty much like that. Karu had a different approach this run. Mitch went all out, executing as many tough strategies as he could and being less concerned about mistakes. Karua, on the other hand, went for a more consistent run, but his initial goal was to avoid dying, something TJP and Mitch failed to do. Hey, he also Mitch failed to do. I did die a lot. Karua had like the benefit of like watching speedruns from the sidelines. Karua is a very smart person. He was able to watch my speedruns and be like, okay, these strategies are faster, but if I did this, I bet I won't die there. Keeping with his conservative strategies, Karua saved a lot of items for the later worlds. 
and P-winged over 6-9 and 7-6. Karua completed the run without dying. Karua's approach was such a smart way for an introduction of speedrunning and breaking records. There were places where I made mistakes all the time and Karua was able to capitalize on that. And that was actually really smart. There wasn't anything new introduced. There was no, no new strategies acquired. It was a lot more like, how can I beat my opponent? He wanted to achieve a clean world record and then return to improve it in the future. So in hindsight, Perua's methodology behind speedrunning has a stopping point because at the end of the day, you know all those tough strategies, as long as someone's willing to do them, that's where it's gonna go, right? So Karua was over half a minute ahead into world seven, but he still had to get the seven one clip. First try. I don't want to tell you how many times Karua beat my records by getting 7-1 clips and no hands and shit. I don't want to talk about it. World 8 is a very interesting world in Mario 3 speedruns. Mm -hmm. On its surface, it doesn't seem that difficult. Nearly half the stages are auto-scrollers, but the remaining levels, 8-1, 8-2, the fort, and Bowser's castle, they're just hard enough that when combined with the pressure of being on world record pace, it can be very easy to make a mistake. I have always said that in Mario 3, World 8 is really not that hard. Some of the strategies are, they're pretty okay. But when you're on PB pace or world record pace, there's something weird that happens to World 8. And it all of a sudden becomes the hardest world. And it's not until you're on PB or world record pace. So you never get to experience that situation until your PB pace or world record pace, it is like the weirdest experience in a game I've ever had. I know exactly how to do every level in World 8 just as well as I know how to do World 1, but for some reason, World 8 just changes. Three consecutive levels with a mistake. The pressure may have gotten to Karua, but incredibly, he still pulled off a world record by seven seconds. So for anyone wondering, 2013 was one of the years where I'm pretty sure I took a very long break from Mario 3. I think it was like six months I had to change provinces. I was trying to work new jobs and different things. Speedrunning was not a career choice. It wasn't a path. I had to let it go in certain aspects of my life. I loved it and I wanted to do nothing more than to speedrun, but I had to step aside. So Karua was able to take over Mario 3 for quite a while there. Yep, I had a girlfriend at the time. You know, I don't think she wanted me to always play. Excuses, they, I mean, they're kind of excuses, but at the same time, just the reality of it. The improvements came from making fewer mistakes and slowly adding in small time saves. An example of this is 4-1. Karua used to never build P-Speed in this level and just jumped his way through while slowing down as little as possible. He picked up a Koopa sh so this is 2013. I want to see if I actually grab the shell in my individual level. Because my individual levels was before Karua started speedrunning Mario 3. I, I don't think I do, but let's take a look. I definitely don't grab the shell here. There's no way. This was 2011, two years before Karua. Nice try, Karua. Where'd you learn that strat? The gap between the two of them was nearly two full minutes. But then, something interesting happened. Mario 3 100% was accepted into AGDQ 2014. Only this time, it would be a co-op run, with Mitch and Karua both playing. That's right. It wasn't until like around 2000, near the end of 2013, 2014, I started to realize, you know what? I just like speedrunning and I like playing, so I'm gonna do it, so. This was a record improvement of seven seconds, but there- Okay, this, this is a very important time in my life, okay? This stream comes from a time in my life where I was struggling a lot, not enjoying the kind of work I was doing. I was living in an apartment, really not making any money, but I just could not stop speed running and playing Mario 3. Streaming was like a pastime. It was something I used to do when I finished work. I'd come home from work at like 2 a.m. after working at a restaurant. You know, when I first started at the restaurant too, I was a dishwasher. So I was like a 24 year old dishwasher. I had no confidence whatsoever. I don't think I crack a smile during the entire speed run. I was still smoking cigarettes in the apartment. I just wasn't really in much of a good place. Mitch's strategies were quite different than Karua's. In the World 2 Fort, for instance, Mitch intentionally lost five to damage boost off the spike. You guys saw me do that a couple it's times today. After 15 months of dominance from Karua, Mitch was back on top. 
I never felt that in life I was on top. No, these world records, world records in Mario 3 with the way my life was going in my 20s, they're the only thing that gave me any shred of like importance or like relevance. That's why Mario 3 is such an important game to me because at my lowest lows, right? I still had Mario 3 to fall back on and speed run and play. I built up a lot of my confidence from being the world record holder in something. It helped me. If I didn't have that, I don't know where I'd be today, man. I have no clue what my life would be like. At this point in my life, I do not need the Mario 3, like reassurance. Like I don't hold on to the records or anything like that. You know, holding on to it was the was the right thing to do. And instead of a 12th try 7 1 clip, Karua got it first try. Really? Karua got a clip first try? Three. Don't it believe it. The, the trick is in World 3, saves 3 seconds, and fittingly is named Door 3. <laughs> yeah! You're supposed to go into the 6th door, then jump up to a higher door and enter the boss corridor. However, if you instead enter the third door and press up to re-enter the door as soon as Mario spawns on the next screen, you can enter it again and are sent straight to the what boss What a cool corridor. trick. You only have one frame to press up as you spawn on the screen. And if you miss, you fall into the water and lose 11 seconds. 11 it's seconds. It's Mission Karua had their GDQ run. And then both players took a break from 100%. RNG. It's time to talk about the Hammer Brothers. Fucking assholes, that's what they are. Ah, you guys, man, every run, I'm gonna get gray hairs before anything else. After every level you complete, or every time you die, these Hammer Brothers randomly move in an available direction. They only intend to move one space at a time, but they can only stop on an unoccupied tile. Mm -hmm. So if they land on a level or another Hammer Brother, they have to move again. So the worst part about Mario 3 speedruns is that everyone knows about the hands and everyone knows about the Hammer Brothers. So it turns people off from speedrunning this game, which I personally, I hate that so much because Hammer Brothers and hands in Warpless and 100% don't play a massive role in your abilities to get better until you get down to like, let's say Warpless. I wanna say 53, 52 minute range. In Warpless, if you have like, a 58 minute run, trust me, you have a lot more work to do than to worry about the hands or the Hammer Brothers. You cannot care about Hammer Brother movements at all and you can get a juicy like 111.05 and not even worry about them. Speedrunner Stewie Cartman has one of the longest Hammer Brother movements on record. So the exact reason why the Hammer Brothers did that is because when this Hammer Brother right here decided that he wanted to go right and up to this tile. It had nothing to do with this Hammer Brother or anything, but this Hammer Brother was like, you know what? I'm going right and up. This Hammer Brother also decided, you know what? I'm going all the way up too. So after they moved up there, they both decided to go up and then they have to follow each other since then. Hammer Brothers can't turn back around, so they had to continue on their path. Now they couldn't split here because there's a completed level. Hammer Brothers can't cross over completed levels. So the only place for the Hammer Brothers to move was from this mushroom house all the way down here until this tile right here. They could go inside and up, sure, but when Hammer Brothers get stuck on top of each other, they need a three-way intersection to split because at a three-way intersection, one of the Hammer Brothers has to decide to go down and then the other would have to decide to go left. They both decided to go up. Now they're stuck. Now they're on their way back. Okay, they could split here, but they choose not to. They could split here, but they chose not to because they're idiots. They could split again. Like literally the odds of them crossing the three-way bridge. What was that? Four times, three times and not splitting? Like what? Ah, uh, look at Karua. Look at this scrub. Look at this scrub. Two flowers. Get better, nerd. I never get two flowers in World 1 except like seven times a day, bro. Try and get stars for once. Karua had built up a substantial lead and it just kept getting better. 7-1 clip was how many times Karua got 7-1 first try? And at this point, there was no subpixel manipulation. It was literal luck, man. Copium, I know. His runs used to make me very nervous all the time. He was always such a good player. Karua set two 100% records in March 2015. A 111.24 followed by a 111.02. Oh, two, that was the crazy. The gap on just three months into his absence, Karua's record was gone. The guy who did it was named I Love Mario, the first 110 in the game's history. You wanna know the worst part about when your world record's broken? It's always at a time where you're like on the couch relaxing 
relaxing or like doing something with like family or friends and you just your phone just blows up of like discord and fucking notifications you're at a family barbecue having a good time you lost you lose you lost you lose someone beat your record it's so crazy to think of these speed runs like a 11056 the world record is almost a minute and a half faster than that like from this point where are you getting a minute and a half like it's nuts so how would karua respond this time around he decided he was going to do an all out grind yeah. You want to know what's funny? The strategy shown in the video right now is a strategy that didn't even exist RTA when Karua speed ran the game. It wasn't until like two years after Karua retired when I had created the 4-5 the P speed here. I don't think summoning salt showing it specifically because like, oh, this is what Karua did when he came back. I think this is just like the viewing pleasure clips. He decided he was going to do an all out grind. Yes, he did. His I goal was- I actually waited too. I remember I was still doing Mario Maker. I wasn't really playing much Mario 3 at all for like 2015 16 it was kaizo's rom hacks and mario maker and i actually kind of didn't get involved in mario 3 until you know Back. as always there were new strategies in this grind karua implemented two big ones the first was in 6-10 a strategy that allowed you to maintain p speed through yeah. the whole level I specifically remember creating this strategy because in the video, I think it shows me having a cigarette in my hand. Hold on, let me take a look. 2015? Yeah, here it is. Look at how old this is. You have to do this whole like setup thing. It took a long time to figure out. Like I can't just, well, I can do that, right? Yeah. All, all of that hard work just to find that from 2015, eight years ago, keep your P-Speed. That's my message to you. Keep your P-Speed. It goes without saying that this requires brutally tough platforming. It does. But the, the other new strategy was in 7-7. Ah, yes. We've seen a lot of tricks in World 7, but this is easily the worst of them all. This is the 7-7 clip. You need to land on the corner pixel of the pipe. You need the correct vertical pixel, plus the correct horizontal pixel, and the correct sub-pixels for both the horizontal and vertical directions. It saves 17 seconds over playing the stage normally, but getting a first try is both figuratively and literally a pipe dream. It and looks so easy. Try, World 7 as a whole had turned into a nightmare. You've got the 7-1 clip, the 7-7 clip, the 7-9 clip, and several other difficult levels. But it's what Karua had to do if he wanted this grind to be a success. So there's an interesting thing to note about Karua's mindset and what he wanted to do with this category. He knew that someone like me would still play this category, and he knew that I knew about all these tricks. So in order for him to secure the run that he wants, he knows he has to do all these tricks because he knows I will also do all those tricks. So this was one of the first grinds where Karu was like, I've had enough of being conservative with my strats and I'm gonna full on be a professional Mario 3 speedrunner. I'm gonna go for all the hard strats and I'm gonna show everyone what I'm capable of. And he fucking did it, it was crazy. Karu was on a solid run through World 3. The next few worlds were up and down, but he was within striking distance going into World 7. The world got off to a good start second try 7-1 clip. Then, he arrived at 7-7. <laughs> he didn't this even know. Just got, but there was still World 8. Sure enough, in 8-1, he lost P-Speed to lose a few seconds. But he still closed it out for a 1-10-52. And then came November 9th, 2016, when maybe the craziest run in Mario 3 history took place. Maybe. But he started off with the first try 7-1. Getting 7-1 first try, you're always happy, but at the same time, I know 7-7 is where it's gonna be decided. He makes a good point there because as a speedrunner at our like caliber, we have no emotions for 7-1 anymore. Like the old days in Warpless, you get 7-1, you're on a pace. If you're already at World 7, then your run is already decent. And then 7-1 means you have it, but we be in 100%, you become numb to 7-1. And then you get even more frustrated when you fail 7-1. Failing 7-1 in 100% means you don't get a chance to 7-7. You need to get every single run to 7-7 has to be. On the pace of his life, he just had to get this eventually, and he'd have a golden opportunity.
Unbelievably, Karua was moments away from getting the world's first 109. That run was, it really was special. It's so sad to see him talk about how special that run was. He had to get a good world eight. And then, yeah, eight one happened. I didn't know if I could even finish the run because I was so upset at myself. And I ended up getting a hit in eight two because of it. I just didn't care at that point. Karua hasn't done a 100% run since, and he stopped speedrunning as a whole in 2017. But my goodness, did he go out on top. Dude, if he didn't die. This was the leaderboard the day Karua set the 110.19. This was the leaderboard a year later. Hey, okay? I'm doing Mario Maker. I moved from Canada to the United States. I was doing Dram World 2, and then Mario... Shut up, everyone! I'm in like eighth place. Even two full years later, none of these guys could catch up to Karua. It seemed like the 110.19 was destined to stay on top. Wait a minute. Mitch <laughs> there I am at the bottom. Did you guys know that I came back and did 100%? Yeah, it was like in 2017 or 2018. I came back to Mario 300%. I got a one second PB and then I left again. I literally came back for a one second PB and then I walked. His PB was a mid 111 and he very quickly rose up the leaderboard. So you guys talk shit now very quickly. You don't hear summoning salt use that little phrase all that often. Yeah, that's right very quickly yeah nobody's talking smack to me that's what makes it funny like nobody's saying shit right now he lost fire in 4-4 and lost p speed in 6-10 he missed 7-9 clip and took two tries to get 7-7 mitch was 16 seconds behind and could make that time up in world 8 he had to avoid a critical mistake i had to avoid it <sighs> we did it despite mitch sucking he, he kept it close. He didn't use many new strategies either. He simply let his skills from the past few years take him past Karua. But who's in third place? That would be Louie with a 110.35. And when Mitch stepped aside from 100% after setting the record, again, it was Louie's time to shine. I kept stepping aside with 100%, always. I just was like, all right, get it. And then I'd be like, I'm out of here. I don't know why. In July, 2019, after a steady series of PB improvements, Louie broke through with a 110.08, taking the top spot by six full seconds. And there's one key trick that Louie was able to use to his advantage, 7-1 subpixel manipulation. To get the 7-1 clip, your subpixel value needs to be correct. This value can range anywhere from 0 to 15, and normally it's impossible to pick your value. But there's a few rules you can use to help. Tapping left or right for one frame will usually decrease or increase it by one value, while tapping it for two frames will usually move it by four values. Rule two, having a subpixel value between zero and six. This reminds me of like iRobot. There's three rules that you must follow. And rule three, when wrapping around from subpixel 15 to zero, Mario visually moves forward. For anyone wondering, that is the absolute ticket for uh, subpixel manipulation. The fact that Mario moves the pixel when wrapping over gives you all the information you need. That's it, you have all the information. You have a brief window where you can set up your subpixels for the next level, which is 7-1. By quickly tapping right and stopping when you see Mario visually move, you'll usually stop between a value of 0 and 6. This makes the 7-1 clip much easier to hit on the first try as long as you do the inputs correctly. Mm -hmm. Enough was enough. That's, I got and interested. And the race for the first oh, wow. 109 was officially on. Mitch was the favorite to get it, given his resume of past Mario 3 records. Okay. Mitch was 13 seconds ahead going into World 7, but it was time for the clips. Oh, I went back to my roots, man, thank God. That was first try. You don't expect it. Mitch needed one more clean world, and this would be it. This would be it. What? Who does that? Get a 
it together. Look at look at my face right now. Like after I press this pause, look at my face right here. I'm so mad. Honestly, with how good of a run that was, that was a pretty passive, calm reaction. I handled that one pretty well. Well, it was still a world record. But once again, the 109 had been lost to World 8. Since he'd gotten the record back, Mitch stopped running 100% after this. What a surprise, I stopped 100%. New to the top 10 was Maiba. Half a minute from the record, not being in the top 5. Surely Maiba wasn't going to be the guy to get this. Right? Wrong again. On Nice, you can hear Maiba like pop off a little bit. You know what I hate about the Famicom controller is that the cord is right here on the side. I don't think I'd be able to hold my controller if the cord was on the side right here. The top just seems like it makes sense. I don't know, sometimes the cord gets in your way, but a cord on the side, that's so crazy. Once again, just one world separated him from the first 109. I was watching this run live. I remember waking up at like 6.30 in the morning and I checked Twitch while I was laying in bed. I just went on my phone and I saw that he was live and I went into his stream and he had already done World 7. That was so heartbreaking. But also, <laughs> He lost 18 seconds in World 8, and again, the first 109 had slipped away. No, I did not curse him. When people are on good pace Mario 3 runs, I won't say anything in chat. And it's not like, oh my god, Mitch is like a crazy celebrity. It's that like, I don't know how other people are going to react to me being there, but I am watching. I'm always watching. I'm there. Not all the time. In September 2020, another runner began climbing up the leaderboard. His name was Chikubi. In the past, Chikubi was pretty much constantly in the top 10, but had never threatened the world record. It's so annoying because Chikubi is so good at Mario 3. He's always been a world record contender. I don't know what it is with him and his mistakes though. I've never understood it. Like every speedrunner like chokes in certain situations at certain points, but his follow through was just longer than everyone else's sometimes. I don't know what it is, maybe the way he gets nervous or the inexperience, right? I mean, the longer you run Mario 3, the more control you have in those very high intense emotional moments. The best pace anyone had ever been on. He started bleeding time in World 6 with a missed star grab, late P-speed in 6-4, and a movement of 4. And 7-7 seven, seven clip was 4th try, which is good but not great. Mm -hmm. He was still ahead of the record into World 8. Once again, with a really good world, he could get the 109. And guess what? Chikubi played an excellent World 8. His only mistake was a very small one in Bowser's Castle. The door miss. But he didn't get the 109 because he got pulled in by all three hands. Each hand has a 50-50 chance of pulling you in. The odds of being pulled in by all three hands is just one in eight. If he was pulled in by one hand or fewer, this would have been the 109. He had to settle for a 11002. In October 2020, Mitch came back to the 100% grind, and sure enough, he had a few new strategies to help. Oh yeah. And in 7-2, he had a new strategy he had adopted from the task. Instead of turning back at the start, you can just go forward and intentionally take damage, then just barely build P speed before reaching the gap. But the big one was in 7-5. If you equip a P-Wing and a star, then do a frame-perfect jump into the corner of the pipe, you're practically guaranteed to have the correct subpixels. So Summoning Salt says you're practically guaranteed to get the clip, and he's absolutely right. Upon doing my testing, exiting 7-3, and I did every single subpixel, and I perfectly jumped into the pipe, only two subpixels don't work. Out of all the clips in the game, this one was the last one to enter the 100% speedrun, and it's the most free one. It was the most rewarding, stressless time save in Mario 3 in the longest time. I was so happy to add this clip into the run. Just like that, Mitch was five seconds ahead, putting him on pace for a 109.57. Here we go again. My eye roll is the eye roll of somebody who's been running this game for 10 years and is just fucking fed up with these mistakes. 
I think Summoning Salt said that he had to edit out more swear words from me than anyone else, I think, because I'm always swearing and shit. I'm always saying something. Hey, it's personal therapy, okay? I need to be screaming about something. I gotta get the hell out of this game. <laughs> How did this keep happening? Another failed 109. So the Mario 300% world record was actually a 110.01, a 110.03, and a 110.02. So it had the one, two, three of the seconds of the 110, which is just like, that is just absurd, man. A few more months passed and 2021 came around. Early that year, Mish decided to give the 100% grind one more try. He was far behind entering World 6, but he cleaned up some small mistakes there and had an excellent World 7. This looks familiar. Mitch was a bit behind, but had several seconds to save coming up. World 8 had to be clean. I took damage on that sun from a different spot than the last run. So in my mind, I'm like, you know what? Fine, I'm changing it up. I'm gonna jump somewhere else. I'm not gonna get hit by the sun. Like I can't escape the sun, man. 8-2, I, look at that face cam. That is a face of disbelief. All Mitch could do now was finish out the run and see what time he got. <laughs> My first 69! It wasn't a perfect run, but aside from taking damage, Mitch finally had a great World 8. But the breather didn't last very long. Just a month and a half later, Mitch- You hear that little chuckle in Summoning Salt's voice? You think it's funny that somebody beat me in a month? The same guy who missed the first 109 months earlier thanks to a bit of a meltdown in World 8. But this time, there was no <laughs> meltdown. Sad. He got a 109.58, beating Mitch by frames. So with this run, I was actually, I was like relieved in a sense. Normally, old Mitch would be very upset that somebody beat my record within a month. I'd be very emotional about it. I was actually more relieved because the goal was to be, you know, one of the first people to get the 109. And my getting this run that close to me was like a sigh of relief that like, Holy crap, it, it was so close for me to not be the first person to get it. I was very happy he got it, and I was excited that somebody beat my run because, you know, it gives me more to go for, but it was nice to see him actually get the damage list. He saved 20 seconds in World 8. You'd love to see it. That in July 2021, Mitch returned to do one final grind of Mario 300%. I got off screen wand grab and it's a trick where you can jump off the wall and grab the wand at the top of the screen. And uh, once you do that, you don't have to screen wrap down and it saves about four seconds. You kind of tighten up a little bit after off screen wand grab. It gets serious. World four just started to work really clean. Um, I don't think I got a massive amount of Hammer Brother movements. And then I got another off screen wand grab. So that, that just completely changed the route again. I mean, it was just a bag of emotions. Getting two off-screen wand grabs in a run is like, what? That's so stupid. Like, I don't even think about that. And now we're at the point where I'm actually trying to get off-screen wand grabs in Worlds 1 and in Worlds 3, right? And that's overall, it's just going to increase my, oh man, I'm very excited to see where 100% goes from here. I'm very excited. So 8-1 and 8-2 and 8-4 went uh, pretty smooth. I didn't have any massive mistakes that cost me a whole lot of time. And then we just uh, clutched out uh, Bowser's Castle. Yes! After getting the record back with a run like that, I, I mean, I had Runaway Bro in World 3. I mean, that that's such a massive time loss. And I was feeling very consistent, so I, I just didn't want to stop there. I wanted to keep going and see if I can uh, get that free World 3 time save and maybe a couple more off-screen wand grabs, see what happens. July 18th, what is that, four days later? I need to clutch out 7-1 first try, which I did, which was uh, really good. 7-2 went well. 7-5 though is another level with big time save. I didn't get the clip in the previous world record and uh, I do nail it, which is uh, really good. So at that moment right there, I know, okay, this run is real now. We nailed 7-7, seven, seven. we got that third try, which is the same, so we didn't lose any time. And then we just finished off world seven normally with Fire Flower, which 
brought me in somewhere around minus seven seconds uh, compared to the world record. So with this run, I was finally able to execute some of uh, some new P-Speed strategies in World 8 in the hand levels where you use a star and eight trap one uh, and you turn back and you get like P-Speed. I was able to do that in this run. And then I got a P-Speed strategy in hand trap two, which is another about a second time save. Did your goals shift at all after getting the 52 or were you like let me just keep going to a time i can get so my answer is i have no idea why i kept going four days later i, I beat the record three runs, times um, in like eight days one so stupid. when i opened up world five with a movement of four yep right away first movement a movement of four and then another movement of four two movements of four in a row let's go baby and then another movement of four. We got another one! Three movements of four in a row! What a surprise! And I got another movement of four. Four movements in a row, baby! Let's go! I'm, I'm so like mad really well at the hammer For the most brothers. part, ah, you guys, man! I'm very nervous at this point. After getting 7-1 and 7-5, I am really, really nervous. I was so like blown I'm wearing away my Mars Volta shirt. First... You rarely ever maximize your gameplay with 7-7 seven, seven perfectly. Ever. I'm s ever. You never maximize your gameplay and get 7-7. Seven, seven. It just does, it's incredible how often that does not work. Like I might've over exaggerated on video the way I was acting when I got 7-7, seven, seven, but inside I didn't react enough. It was by far the best world seven i've ever had alongside the best run i've ever had as you can tell but it was um it was insane after all those thoughts running through my head we approach hand stage one and i actually nailed it with the start eight one worked out okay eight two he tried man he tried that son tried so hard i swear to god after this run i am convinced that there's something in this game that wants to hit me with that sun okay. so badly. One of the things to note with Bowser's Castle is that the three hardest things I would say in the level is the statue room at the end, getting P-Speed there, uh, the one-up clip, and then the last one is the duck jump at the very end on the donuts. Once you get past the donut spot, you can say to yourself, oh my God, I actually did it. However, Bowser does have one pattern where he can jump and shoot the fireball at the same time. And when he does that, the fireball will be shot where you're standing. You can't avoid it. There's nothing you can do. Thinking about this run still makes me nervous. It is a run where I don't ever have to go back for it again, but I'm going to. I have never in my 12 years been able to say that about Mario 3 in any category. This 100% run is by far one of my most important speed runs ever. Nearly two years have passed since this run, and it's remained on top without any close calls. As incredible as it is, one day this record too will fall just like all the ones that came before it. This has been the history. Yo, David Gibbons, bro! Little Karua babies right there, little Karua babies. Let's take a look at these supporters here. Yo, Mike Jones, what up? All right, that was that was me reacting to the Summoning Saw video. Obviously, it's an incredible video, and I hope anyone here watching gives me a follow. I still stream this every morning going for the uh the world records and whatnot so i really really hope you guys enjoyed there's obviously you know so much more but summoning salt would can't cover a four-hour video right so yeah thanks for thanks for watching